March 19th marks the anniversary of the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq under the pretext that the then regime of Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction. The U.S.-led bombing campaign and occupation running for nearly nine years left a trail of deaths and destruction in the Arab country. The following report explains why the U.S. invaded Iraq and has been trying to keep its presence there. The United States and its key ally, the UK, launched the Iraq war in 2003 with a strike against a location where then Iraqi President Saddam Hussein and his top commanders were believed to be meeting. But that was not an abrupt attack, as Washington and London had already begun intensifying their military buildups in the Persian Gulf beforehand. U.S. President George W. Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair repeatedly indicated that the assault was imminent and aimed to destroy Saddam's weapons of mass destruction program. But neither U.S when inspectors nor intelligence services could ever find such weapons in Iraq. Ironically, Washington and London gave little heed to calls to allow the inspections process be given more time. Saddam, a once ally who had the full support of the U.S. and Western countries during his eight-year war against Iran, had finally grown too defiant for the U.S. to tolerate. The Iraq war estimated to have cost the U.S. nearly $5.5 trillion and over 4,500 deaths among its servicemen. For Iraqis, the cost was much higher. More than one million people were killed and millions displaced, while millions more continue to face insecurity and poverty. Birth defects and cancer rates also sharply increased, as foreign forces used depleted uranium weapons in civilian areas. Nineteen years on since the U.S.-led invasion, the war agents are yet to be charged for any of their crimes. The U.S. announced ending its combat mission in 2011, but three years later it started boosting deployment again, this time under the pretext of fighting Daesh terrorists. Throughout recent years, there have been multiple reports of Washington's nexus with the Takfiri terrorists, while Iraqis, with the help of the regional resistance front, were fighting themselves to eliminate Daesh. Political observers see the U.S. attacks on Iraqi paramilitary units and anti-terror icons as an attempt to plunge Iraq into chaos to find possible excuses to prolong its presence there. The 2020 assassination of top Iranian commander Lieutenant General Qasem Soleimani and Iraq's senior commander Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis was part of such American plot. In order to uh, discuss that further, we're joined by uh, Mr. Tim Anderson, director of the Center for Hegemonic uh, Studies, who is joining us live from Sydney right now. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Now, President Bush and his advisors built their case for war on the claim that Saddam possessed weapons of mass destruction. Less than a year later, the Americans admitted that not one bit of intelligence about stockpiles of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons in Iraq was true. Still, the U.S. ended the war in December 2011. Why did it take them almost eight years to end a war they conceded was unjustified? Well, I think the key to that is understanding that the war on Iraq was one of eight wars in West Asia and North Africa, which the US was carrying out in service of its plans to create a so-called New Middle East, where the entire region would be under the tutelage of the US and its key allies, Israel and the Saudis. So the pretext in Iran, notoriously false, that it wasn't really why they were, just, just as it wasn't that the pretext for going to Afghanistan, into Syria, into Libya, the invasion of Lebanon and so on. None of those pretexts were really help us explain um, the overall project that the U.S. had in this region. So uh, the U.S. provided Saddam with a classified intelligence and arms during the eight years of war against Iran. Why did the U.S. eventually turn against Saddam? Could it be that the American arms technology and intelligence helped Saddam grow into a regional bully? 
Well, this is often what happens with collaborators. The same thing happened with Manuel Noriega in Panama. They collaborate with the big power, but of course there's no loyalty from the big power to the collaborators. And if they become loose cannons or they decide they've got a bit of their own uh, agenda going on, they can be very easily crushed and destroyed. And I think Noriega shows that. I think that uh, the, uh, the, the collaborators in Afghanistan, when the US left, Kabul showed that to all of these collaborators are expendable and Saddam had become expendable to the US and was no longer an asset to them. Also after the American invasion, a wave of sectarian violence and bloodletting spread through Iraq. How did key US policy choices made in the wake of the 2003 invasion provoke sectarian tensions? Well, it was part of a plan, as uh, historians ha have documented now, that in 2004, 2005, the Bush administration created al-Qaeda in Iraq, which hadn't existed before, and used it specifically to try and divide Tehran from Baghdad. They were very concerned there was going to be a close relationship after the invasion between Baghdad and Tehran, and they wanted to stop that. And so they use it as a tool. They ramped it up later on to use against uh, Syria, and they use it against Syria and Iraq. And of course, they've used it in the Arabian Peninsula too, in Yemen. They've used it in Lebanon. So it's been one of uh, the tools that they've had. And of course, uh, President Biden, when he was vice president in 2014, along with several other officials, admitted that they, at least through their allies, had funded and armed all of the terrorist groups, including ISIS in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, Mr. Tim Anderson, director of the Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies out of Sydney.